Good morning. Can you all hear me? Is this turned on? No? Testing? Testing? Okay. Well, good morning and welcome to the uh, first real event here of ITSIC 2016. Looks like we have a standing room only crowd, which is great for the first event. Uh, this year is looking very strong, and we really appreciate you all being here. We, there's a lot of the same faces, but an also a, an awful lot of new faces in the crowd, which is great. Uh, and the attendance, uh, especially by some of the junior military that haven't been allowed here for several years due to travel constraints, is really uh, quite remarkable, and it's appreciated by all, um, and I, I know that. So we're, what we're doing here today is uh, getting the congressional perspective. Uh, represented by the, um, the members of the Congressional Caucus on Modeling Simulation. This is a, a caucus that was created uh, some years ago, uh, headed up by Congressman Randy Forbes and Bobby Scott, who will be here in a second, uh, as co-founders. Uh, the caucus has grown to over 30 uh, strong in, on the House side, and it's, uh, it is really focused on promoting the, the use of modeling simulation and uh, in training systems as well as across the entire span for, um, for use. And it's, uh, it's something that's high tech. It's, uh, it's hard to really understand modeling simulation from the lay perspective. And uh, so we do a couple of things a year. Uh, this is one, uh, we also, really act as Congressman Forbes' staff on the, as, on the NTA, NTSA side to help uh, facilitate and create um, legislative initiatives that are, that are modeling and simulation based, as well as uh, we run a leadership summit for Congressman Forbes and the caucus in the spring, which is designed to get the leaders in the modeling simulation community together. It's usually held in uh, Hampton Roads area. Uh, to discuss ways that we can go forward on the Hill to promote modeling simulation and the use thereof. So the, um, the other things that we do uh, within, the, uh, within the congressional realm on the NTSA side is, uh, is to run a very small but effective uh, simulation expo up in the Rayburn building on the hill in July of every year. So we take training systems to the hill and, um, and put them inside the building where they can't get away and we get quite a, quite a few members and uh, the staff sp specifically uh, to, to come through and touch and you know, put their hands on some of the training products that you see out here on, on, the, uh, on the floor. And again, it's awareness. A lot of people don't know what it is. They, they um, don't have a great understanding for it. Um, so it's a great place for a dialogue. So today we're gonna hear from uh, two members, not members, but two heavy uh, hitters in terms of supporting training systems and modeling simulation. Uh, first, we're gonna hear from Congressman Micah via uh, video, and then I'll introduce uh, Congressman Bobby Scott from Virginia. Um, both of them, Congressman Micah has not on the caucus, but he is uh, the local uh, really representative, has been a very, very strong advocate for modeling simulation and training systems over time, and uh, has, has been a great advocate for the, the types of technologies you see here at, at IITSIC. So with that, can we uh, run the video for Congressman Micah? Hello, this is Congressman John Micah, and I just want to take this opportunity to welcome everyone to the 50th uh, ITSIC and uh, Training and Simulation Conference in Orlando in Central Florida. Welcome from whatever part of the country or the world you came to, and you're here on an important mission. I'm sorry I can't be with you. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as they say, a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Um, and with redistricting, I no longer be in Congress, but I have had 24 uh, absolutely remarkable years, nearly a quarter of a century, uh, to be involved in uh, various programs and projects. And one of the most important has been um, simulation. Started out uh, some time ago with a military. Uh, it was just a live 
fire training exercise uh, to train our troops uh, with a simple weapon. Uh, and it's turned over the past uh, two decades and many decades you all have been working on into one of the most sophisticated uh, and effective approaches to training, to manpower preparedness uh, that you could imagine. Uh, last year when I was on the floor, uh, my jaw just dropped at the advancement and the use of t uh, simulation and modeling. The applications are just astounding. And what they can do uh, to make our military better prepared. And not only the military now, um, simulation from what we've done in Central Florida around the country uh, now dominates so many activities. Uh, even in Central Florida recently, I got to participate in the opening of a Veterans Medical Simulation Center, now the Nation Center. So um, first I wanna thank uh, you all uh, for your courtesy working with you. Uh, I want to thank Admiral Robb for his leadership. Uh, people like uh, Tom Baptiste, who's le led the National Center, uh, a great advocate on behalf of simulation. And then, of course, my good friend, Wayman Armstrong, uh, one of the private sector leaders who never stops working uh, in the industry for its advancement. So while I can't be with you, I'm tidying up some affairs as I depart Congress. I, I do want to leave you with an important message, and we've had other great leaders I've worked with. Uh, unfortunately, the same thing happened with redistricting to my good colleague, uh, Randy Forbes. Uh, you've got Bobby Scott, uh, who, uh, again, has been by our side. And simulation is a Republican or Democrat or independent issue. It's an important issue for the whole country, and Bobby's helped lead that effort. And there will be others coming uh, forward, and you need to help identify them uh, and get them involved. Uh, I always remember Tom Baptiste, he kind of summed it up when he came to the Hill. He says, sometimes you talk to members or staff and sometimes even folks in the military and you mention simulation and this glaze comes over their eyes. They really don't know too much about it. But now more than ever, it's important that you get to those new members uh, to the new military. And I'm very optimistic about the new administration. I think we'll have a strong uh, Secretary of Defense. I think we'll have strong leaders in each uh, of the services uh, who also will be proponents of simula simulation and modeling and training um, because they're faced with the same challenge uh, that our country and our nation is faced with, and that's budget constraints, but also the need to be prepared and have us ahead of all of the rest of the world in those kinds of activities. Cybersecurity, there's just so many uh, important areas that we've got to excel in. So um, I, uh, while I depart, I leave you with the challenge to educate those new members. The other thing too is we started some acquisition reform and we can't be uh, mired in the past uh, programs. Simulation, like any technology, is always advancing. And while it might be nice to have a contract doing the same thing time and time again, we do need to change out our approaches. And, um, and that's one thing I would say uh, that we need to, to look at is staying ahead of the curve, not having our acquisition behind the curve, either in what we're acquiring or how we acquire it. Because uh, as you know, Sometimes the process of changing the acquisition and requirement uh, regime is, is very difficult. But I'm optimistic, and you should get in there now as we change administrations uh, and educate people and then make the system work better so simulation can be even more beneficial in the future than it is now. Um, it has been a great uh, run. Uh, when I came in, uh, as I said, uh, simulation was just a a small activity with one of the services. It's grown now um, across every branch of the services. It's recognized and it should be because of its importance, its savings, and uh, the, the most important uh, effect is the readiness of uh, our men and women in service to the, our country. So uh, I'm very grateful to have been a small part of uh, the growth of the industry and the growth of the applications and uh, and also uh, highlighting the importance uh, across the 
the board to admit past administrations, and now you have the challenge of getting to new uh, leaders. So, Congressman John Micah, I bid you a fair, fine farewell. I'll be working with the industry any way I can in the future. I've uh, got a few good contacts in the new administration, and uh, first thing I'm, uh, off of my lips will be uh, how important the, this activity is uh, to the United States of America. Thank you again. Honored to uh, spend a few last moments with you and appreciate every one of you for your service to the United States of America. Thank you and God bless you. John Micah. All right. So um, change is happening everywhere and that's part of what we do and part of the technologies that uh, challenges we have are the assimilation of change so that, that the process is going on in Congress as you know. So at this point, I'd like to introduce uh, Congressman Bobby Scott. He's from the uh, 3rd District in Virginia. Uh, he's been in Congress since 1992, and he's been at every ITSIC since, uh, since 2007 as part of this activity. So please help me welcome Congressman Bobby Scott. Thank you, Admiral, Admiral Rob, for your very uh, kind introduction, and it's certainly a pleasure to be back in Orlando for this ISIC uh, conference, the 50th anniversary. It's also um, pleased to uh, recognize Linda Brent and Barbara McDaniel and all of the NHTSA staff for sponsoring uh, this event. It's, uh, we always look forward to it, and it helps uh, members of Congress uh, recognize the uh, importance of modeling and simulation. It's also an honor to follow uh, John Micah. John and I were elected uh, the same year, 1992, and he has been a long supporter of modeling and simulation, and I look forward to working with his successor in Congress, Stephanie Murphy. Uh, but uh, John has been working hard, and uh, I expect him to be a continuing force in modeling and simulation. I've also um, uh, been pleased to serve on the Modeling and Simulation Caucus, it's been founded, founded by my friend and Virginia colleague, uh, Randy Forbes, who has been the real vision of modeling and simulation over the years. He will, as uh, John mentioned, be unfortunately be leaving Congress at the end of this term, uh, but don't count Randy out. He is, as I understand it, on the short list being considered as Secretary of the Navy. And if he is um, uh, picked, there won't be anybody who will work harder and uh, knows more about the military, especially the Navy, than, uh, than my friend from Virginia, Randy Forbes. Uh, with that said, I want to uh, thank uh, Admiral Robb and everyone for um, inviting us here. This is, as I said, one of many conferences I've attended, and each one uh, brings uh, bigger and better things. The um, uh, goggle technology, the resolution on the, uh, on the simulation is getting better and better every year. You're also uh, doing something that I think will, uh, is a great thing um, generally, but can cause some political heartburn, and that is you're trying to limit the platforms that you're using so that you can actually communicate with yourselves. Uh, that's uh, great in terms of um, governance, but it's, um, if you uh, happen to have somebody in your district that is on a platform that isn't picked, uh, that um, obviously can cause some, uh, some problems. Go forward anyway and just uh, leave the problems to us. Um, one of the things I understand that you're doing is making sure that when you've paid for the development of technology, the government owns the technology, and that way others can use it and you don't get into uh, the um, perverse situation where competitors are having to pay royalties to each other, uh, to their competitors. And uh, so, as I said, go forward and uh, we'll just try to deal with the political art burden as it, uh, as it happens. Um, Devna Robb and everybody here knows that we're diligently to make sure that the Modeling and Simulation Caucus continues. The loss of Randy will be um, obviously a setback, but um, uh, we can go forward. Um, it's important uh, that businesses contact their members of Congress. I think uh, John uh, mentioned this to express the importance of modeling and simulation. Um, members of Congress respond better when they hear from their constituents 
than member to member, and uh, to the extent that you can contact your members and show them the importance of modeling and simulation, we're much li more likely to get uh, their cooperation uh, back in Washington. The Modeling and Simulation Caucus provides a forum to educate members of Congress and their staffs in the importance of this industry and to every uh, sector of our nation's economy. The caucus also provides industry with the opportunity to come to Capitol Hill, as has been uh, referenced each year, to showcase how this technology can be utilized in various fields and how you can uh, uh, perform, perform your services uh, better and cheaper, uh, which is always of interest to members of Congress. Uh, my commitment to the caucus is actually twofold. I'm a proud to represent the 3rd Congressional District of Virginia, whose citizens, businesses, colleges, and universities have been leaders in the field of modeling and simulation. Uh, VMASC, uh, Virginia Modeling and Simulation Center at Old Dominion University, was founded in 1997 and has been obviously a leader in the field. In addition, we, many use um, uh, modeling and simulation in military assets in Southeast Virginia. Uh, we have universities like Old Dominion, Norfolk State, Hampton University, um, NASA Langley Research Center, uh, Joint Base Langley de Eustis, um, Naval Station Norfolk, Nupanu Shipbuilding, all are directly involved in using and expanding modeling and simulation technology. But in the addition to the presence, uh, rep in, in addition to representing the interests of my constituents, uh, I also um, greatly appreciate modeling and simulation in its growing role in helping our nation solve critical problems. Uh, you know that the technology allows us to build and develop models of complex systems, whether it be a car, an airplane, an entire battlefield, a city's evacuation plan, public transportation network, even the human body, to see how certain actions can affect the end result. By using modeling and simulation, we're able to save money and make sure we're making the right decisions long before they're actually implemented. Um, and we can see um, how that um, uh, analysis and training can be cost effective. Um, for example, if a pilot in training messes up, you don't have to repair the plane. All you have to do is reboot the computer. You can uh, design aircraft carriers and submarines. Uh, you can show the entire battlefield and see what kind of operations are most effective to get the job done. Now, understanding how critically important modeling and simulation is, uh, Congressman Forbes and I successfully included an amendment to the recent Surface Transportation Authorization Bill calling for the Department of Transportation to utilize modeling and simulation to analyze federally funded highway and public transit projects to ensure that these projects will increase transportation capacity and safety, alleviate con uh, congestion, reduce travel time and environmental impact, and are as cost effective as possible. Now, every time I cross the 14th Street Bridge going into Washington, D.C., I just wish somebody had modeled and simulated that because I'm sure the lane structure could get me there quicker without being stuck in traffic. Uh, on the way uh, here, flying on an airplane, it, it occurs to me that somebody could have modeled and simulated how to get on and off an airplane without having to take a half an hour to do it. Um, now, President-elect Trump has called for the passage of a large-scale large infrastructure project the first 100 days in office. Uh, we don't know the specifics of the plan. I hope and expect the administration will continue to use modeling and simulation to ensure that we're getting the most out of any new federal investments improving our infrastructure. We will always have limited resources to, um, improve, our, uh, to, to improve our infrastructure, so it is critical that we know that the federal dollars are going as far as possible. Modeling and simulation is the best tool to ensure that we're getting that best deal. Now, this this is just uh, one area where we should be highlighting uh, other air. <clears throat> this is just one area where we should be highlighting other uses of modeling and simulation in the federal government. We must continue to encourage interagency cooperation to leverage what has already been accomplished by some agencies to make sure that we're uh, uh, make sure we're getting the best uh, use out of modeling and simulation for all agencies. Unfortunately, Washington has been stymied uh, recently in its advancements in research, development, and technology innovation that could spur uh, cooperation because of budget constraints. We all know that sequestration and other budget cuts enacted in the Budget Control Act of 2011 and subsequent appropriations bills over the f past five years have had a significant negative impact on the nation's defense 
military readiness and our ability to make the investments that we know are necessary to ensure our nation's long-term economic competitiveness. And the worst impact, of course, will be inflicted by sequestration, the across-the-board cuts that automatically go into effect if the Congress doesn't find over a trillion dollars in uh, budget in, in deficit reduction. And um, there's little possibility that we'll actually get that kind of deficit reduction uh, because um, most of Congress has um, uh, pledged to have no tax cuts. And we're already getting to um, a point in spending cuts where we're at the 50-year low as a percentage of GDP. So if you can't cut more and you can't raise revenues more, you're kind of stuck where you, where you are. And last year's bipartisan agreement gave us a reprieve on sequestration, but that only goes through the current 2017 budget year. Uh, keep, uh, and keep in mind, left untouched, uh, sequestration will remain in effect through 2021. And after that, the low budget levels that um, will, will serve as the baseline for future budgets. So more investments are going to be hard to find. Now, President-elect uh, Trump has called for an end of sequestration, but has not released a proposal to show exactly how he will do it. He will propose a budget in a couple of months so we can see on paper what the strategy will be. Unfortunately, the new Congress and the president may be more focused on enacting massive tax cuts rather than dealing with sequestration. And um, the addiction to tax cuts is not a partisan issue. It is a, unfortunately, bipartisan issue. Uh, Obama and the Democratic Senate, along with the Republican House, in um, uh, 2013 uh, passed a, uh, an extension of the uh, Bush era uh, tax cuts at a cost of $3.9 trillion without paying for it. And so I, it's bipartisan. And if we're ever going to get to the fiscal, if we're ever going to get our fiscal house in order, Washington will have to make some tough choices. And we have to honestly articulate to the American people what choices are being made. If tax cuts are proposed, how are you going to pay for them? Are you going to cut Social Security and Medicare? Or do we cut back on defense spending? Or do we make cut investments in education, transportation, NASA, or vital functions of government that grow and expand our economy? And if we show how we're going to pay for the tax cuts, that's just to cover the new tax cuts. Uh, what's the proposal to get us out of the mess we're already in? Now, I think uh, if clearly given the choice, um, the American people will choose better schools, a stronger military, protecting Social Security and Medicare, improving roads and bridges, and investing in cost-saving technology like modeling and simulation over, act, over enacting new massive tax cuts. In fact, I believe that if public would support tax increases uh, if we, to make the investments, to make many of those investments, but we have to present the choices um, that we're making. For example, are you going to, if you're going to have new tax increases, to are you willing to pay more gas tax in order to get better roads and bridges? Now, unfortunately, the way we work in Washington is we make sequential decisions. Like, how would you like a reduction in the gas tax? Hmm, okay. How would you like to build new roads? Hmm, okay. Then how do we get into this deficit mess? Well, that's the, uh, if you do it all at once, then you can see what choices are actually being made. If we make the right choices, we'll be better equipped to make sure that we're able to educate and prepare the next generation of leaders in this industry and other high-tech sectors. And now, I currently serve as a ranking member or top Democrat on the House Education and Workforce Committee. And my, commit my committee is focusing on policies to help ensure that students K through 12 are developing necessary skills to succeed over the course of their lifetime. During this last Congress, we were able to pass a bipartisan reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, replacing No Child Left Behind. And the next Congress, uh, my committee will be focused on uh, considering a long overdue update of the Higher Education Act. Now, as we know, education doesn't end after high school. Today, more than ever, college education is necessary, um, is a necessity, not just a desire. And a college education can represent the difference between a minimum wage job that barely keeps one afloat and a well-paying job with long-term career aspects to provide greater financial flexibility. As we fully shift into a post-industrial economy, less skilled workers will have trouble finding jobs. Most studies tell us by 2020, 
65% of all new jobs will require some kind of education past the high school level. Now that doesn't mean um, uh, four-year liberal arts degree, but some education and training past the high school level. Now, um, we don't want to overlook um, the vocational education. That's very important. And I know um, just recently one of our governors of Virginia suddenly became a strong supporter of vocational education. And I found out what happened. Well, right after he got inaugurated and went over to the governor's mansion, he noticed a little plumbing problem. Well, he knew government well enough not to call general services to ask three low bids, contest the bid. He did what everybody else would have done. He just looked in the uh, Google and find, found the plumber, called the plumber. Plumber showed up, looked at the situation, went out in the truck, got some tools, fixed it, and handed the governor a bill, $150. He said, $150, you're here 15 minutes. $150, that's $600 an hour. When I was practicing law, I never charged anybody $600 an hour. And the plumber said, Governor, I know what you mean, because when I was practicing law, I never charged anybody $600 an hour either. We have, don't overlook those, but you need some education and training for those kinds of jobs. Now, since everybody now uh, needs uh, education past high school, Congress has recognized the need to help people get that education. So in 1965, G uh, Congress passed through the Higher Education Act uh, the um, uh, support for uh, this education. And President uh, Johnson, when he signed the HE HEA nearly 51 years ago, he said, this means that a high school senior anywhere in this great land of ours can apply to any college or any university in any of the 50 states and not be turned away because his family is poor. HEA's goal was still to provide a pathway to the middle class for millions of working families around the country by making college affordable and accessible to everybody. Unfortunately, today we find that the promise of the HEA has eroded. For far too many students, the principles of access and economic opportunity are in jeopardy. Uh, and I know in the 1960s and 70s, with a Pell Grant and a summer job and working uh, 15 hours a week during the school year, you could actually work your way through college without a debt. Now, public colleges, it's hard to get out of a public college, even with the Pell Grant and everything else, without tens of thousands of dollars in debt. And if you go to a private college, $40,000 in debt by the time you finish is not unusual. If you go to a professional school, $100,000 is routine. Now, the fact remains that the college degree is still the surest path to breaking the cycle of poverty that disproportionately impacts our poorest communities, and we must help students persist and graduate. We have to do more to increase the numbers of, co of students who attend college, lower the cost for those who do, and make sure that those who attend actually finish their education on time with a credential that will help them uh, get, a, get a job in the future. You know, many of the credentials that have the highest value will be in the modeling, <clears throat> that have the highest value in the modeling and simulation field will obviously be in the STEM disciplines. Uh, unfortunately, many local school districts and colleges lack necessary uh, resources to provide access to, to the technology that students need to succeed and flourish in, st in, STEM, uh, uh, in the STEM field. As a result, uh, a um, preponderance of American students, particularly minority students, have actually fallen behind those in other industrialized nations in math and science, so it is no surprise that minorities uh, are underrepresented in jobs in that field. And so I strongly believe that our strongest investment are the ones we have to make in education, and Congress must make sure that all students are prepared for the jobs in the rapidly changing 21st century economy. Now, I'm committed to ensuring that our institutions of higher learning are encouraging their students to pursue and continue um, uh, careers in the STEM fields, like modeling and simulation, so that we don't have to rely on the human talent of other nations. In order to do that, the men and women in this room must make sure your voices are heard in Washington. We don't need to convince members of the Modeling and Simulation Caucus about how important you are to our nation, but you have to help convince your colleagues our colleagues outside of the Modeling and Simulation Caucus. So I want to thank you for inviting me to participate again in this year's con conference. I commend you all for your leadership 
that you provide in this issue. The industry is already providing a huge benefit to our nation in the fields of science, national defense, healthcare, homeland security, disaster planning, education, and I know that you're going to continue to play an important role in making our country better. So I'm glad that you're here. I look forward to today's discussion on how we can work together to further enhance and expand this important sector in our economy. Thank you very much. So now we're going to go into our second phase uh, where you get to interact. Uh, you all had a question card on your seat, hopefully, and uh, we solicit any kind of requests uh, for questions from the crowd. I think Linda and a few helpers are out. We can't see you. So um, she's going to collect those. Uh, my request for you is that there's a question on the card and that it's on. <laughs> one side of the paper, uh, and if you could keep it fairly crisp and short and you know politically correct, we would appreciate that. Um, so in terms of the, uh, Congressman Scott, we really appreciate your, your words, and I think you hit a lot of different areas that are important to this crowd. Uh, can you just give us a sense in in D.C. about the election and uh, transitions and the, the, the change that's going on? Well, there are a lot of unknowns. Um, obviously, a new um, uh, administration coming in had a campaign, but you have to transition between the campaign and, the, um, and actually governing. Uh, we've seen this in the um, Affordable Care Act, where you make a lot of allegations. You're going to replace and repeal, or repeal and replace. Um, and um, I think people are recognizing that that's great for the campaign, but when you actually try to implement it, it's going to be problematic. Um, they've said, for example, uh, they like the good parts of it, but don't like the bad parts of it. Well, that's like saying that you like the road project, but you don't like the tolls. The bad parts are, are in there not because we like the bad parts, but because they make the good parts work. Um, Covering people with a pre-existing condition, for example, if, you're gonna, if, you can, if you can wait until you get sick before you get insurance, people will <clears throat> wait until they get sick before they buy insurance. The insurance pool will be a lot sicker than average. Costs go up, more healthy people drop out, and you spiral out of control. So you have to have some way to get everybody into the pool if you're going to cover people with pre-existing conditions. The mechanism we use is the um, penalty, a tax penalty. Okay, well, how else are you going to get it, get it done? If you can come up with a different way to coerce people to buy insurance, then 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 it'll work. But you just can't say you're going to cover people with pre-existing conditions without addressing the fact that you have to find some way to get in. So uh, there's a there's going to be a transition between the campaign and the um, in actual uh, politicking. My opponent, for example, campaigned on the idea that we need more tax cuts, we need more defense spending, and we have to address the, the budget deficit. Well, that works in a campaign, but when you start trying to govern, um, you're going to have to figure out exactly how to reduce the deficit, how to pay for your initiatives, and, um, and that's a little more difficult than, um, than campaigning. And if you're in the majority, if you're in the minority, you don't have to worry about it. You can stay in campaign mood, uh, but, um, uh, but if you are actually trying to govern, you're going to have to have things that actually add up. And so we haven't seen the budget. Um, he has proposed massive tax cuts and additional spending in certain areas, um, and we're going to deal with the deficit. Um, obviously, something's got to give, and we just have to wait until his budget comes forward to see what those numbers look like. And there are a lot of other areas where we have to see the policy. There's a lot of um, politics in terms of um, uh, we got to win, we have to block initiatives without even knowing what they are. I think the better policy is to wait and see what the policies are. Um, if you agree with them, we go forward. If we disagree with them and can kind of recommend amendments to fix it, then let's do that. If it's just totally unacceptable, then you engage the battle. But let's see what the policies are 
in governance, not just in, in, in campaign. And, and so there'll be a lot of uncertainties the next couple of, um, next couple of weeks. On the Education and Workforce Committee, that, that I'm the ranking Democrat, um, I think we can see some battles looming and hopefully we'll see some areas of, um, of commonality where we can work together. One of the areas that seemed to be sort of bipartisan was this idea of repairing infrastructure and uh, or rebuilding the nation. Uh, that again sounds kind of expensive. So, I, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, this is kind of in your lane. Well, this is um, <laughs> the difference between campaigning and governing. As I understand the infrastructure proposal, uh, this expensive infrastructure proposal will be paid for with tax cuts. Um, let's see what the proposal looks like on paper, but I think um, most people recognize that you cannot fund an expensive uh, infrastructure proposal by cutting taxes. And so I think there is a overwhelming consensus that we need to, I think when one of the engineering groups came up with a figure of about $4 trillion in infrastructure needs, roads, bridges, and infrastructure projects, and just to get up to acceptable levels, um, we're not gonna spend four, we're not gonna find $4 trillion uh, all at once, although uh, 3.9 trillion was the um, bipartisan tax cut extension if we had not extended the tax cuts, we'd have had $4 trillion and done all the backlog. backlog. But we'll just have to see what the proposal looks like. Uh, the infrastructure projects are good because we need them and also because they create jobs. And so I think there's a lot of common ground on getting it done, but I expect the um, uh, discussion to be on how you're gonna pay for it. Yes, sir. So on the workforce side, which you're interested in as well, there's a, a significant portion of the country that's not participating at this point uh, and needs to get, we need to get them back into the workforce. Do you have any thoughts about how we can pull these people back into the system, which is part of helping pay taxes as well? Well, a, a lot of it is in job training to make sure that people are qualified for the jobs that they have. Uh, the other is when you cut back on government spending, uh, people think you can do that without losing jobs. When you cut back on uh, National Institute of Health research, uh, some researchers are gonna lose their jobs. Um, so, I mean, there's a direct relationship to government spending and some jobs in, in this. Uh, you know, I think we had it right in the 1990s where um, we're spending right, people had jobs, the economy was going well, created 20 million jobs. And when we cut taxes and cut spending, we kind of went out of whack a little bit and the jobs stopped flowing. Um, we can have jobs bills and infrastructure programs uh, are one, one way to get it done. Um, but at some point, we have to um, recognize that government spending does affect, um, affect jobs. We had the um, uh, almost, I guess it's about $700 billion stimulus package um, in, in, I guess that's in um, 2009, um, about a third of it went to government, local and state government, so they'd stop firing people. Uh, about a third of it went to tax cuts, which I don't think did much good. And a third of it went to job creation, and a lot of it was long-term, not short-term. Um, and so the, I don't think that um, expenditure was nearly as uh, successful as it could have been, it, it made a lot of difference, but it wasn't as um, uh, effective as it could have been. But to get the economy uh, going again, we have to recognize that we're gonna need job training, but we also need uh, targeted expenditures uh, from the government to get the economy back, back on track. Yes, sir. We've got a lot of questions here. So the, um, shifting a little bit to uh, the medical side, uh, there's a question about um, commercial aviation safety record being pretty good uh, and really impressive, but uh, medicine, thousands of patients are uh, victims of uh, preventable deaths inside the system. Um, we 
focus on simulation as part of maybe a, a piece of that solution. Do you have any thoughts on how we can better drive sort of the better practices into the medical system and uh, encourage the use of simulation to improve patient safety? And I think this is, um, I think simulation here would be an excellent strategy for dealing with it. First of all, you've got to identify the preventable deaths. I know just a few years ago, the United States was leading the world in deaths due to preventable disease and deaths due to preventable situations. Um, Modeling and simulation in a hospital can show how you can be more effective, how you can um, uh, perhaps prevent disease from spreading around. Sometimes people, it's been said that the la if, last place you want to go is a hospital because you're likely to pick up diseases that you don't find outside of the hospital. Um, and modeling and simulation can help try to try to control this. So I, I would turn the question back on those who are doing it to help us to uh, recommend uh, the modeling and simulation uh, strategies that can actually reduce uh, deaths. The um, Affordable Care Act had a strategy to try to deal with this. And that is, if you come back to the hospital after you've been recently released, the hospital didn't get paid twice. Um, if you didn't get it right the first time, you're, you know, you're not, we're not going to reward you for um, inflicting damage on people. And that has had a little impact on reducing um, uh, problems, but I think there's a lot more potential. And so those who are in the field should recommend um, modeling and simulation. And once recommended, uh, one of the things that uh, one of the things that can be helpful is if hospitals do not adopt uh, the safety um, um, strategies and people get sick, um, the much maligned trial lawyers, can come and, um, and sue for damages. Um, then that gives the hospital every incentive to do everything uh, cost effective to reduce these uh, preventable, uh, preventable injuries, preventable deaths. And uh, so ho hopefully people in this room will uh, recommend the, um, the strategies and we can go forth and, um, and have them implemented. Yes, sir. That's a, that's a big near and dear to my heart to get that fixed is um, if we were to kill that many people in airplanes, we wouldn't be flying airplanes next week. So it's, uh, it's amazing to me that there's that many uh, preventable deaths in the medical system. Uh, sir, a lot of questions here about acquisition uh, reform and um, specifically, what do you think we could do to streamline acquisition uh, for, for this team, they make things in about six months and then it takes three years to get them implemented and this is a common problem for the technology group that uh, is transform, transforming so quickly and the assimilation, it takes so long and in some cases, uh, you know, too long. It's obsolete by the time we finally get around to it. Do you have any thoughts on how we can, uh, especially for this high-tech system uh, 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 programs, work better in the acquisition? Well, uh, with the present ac acquisition strategy, and, and you know, the acquisition strategy is, is there designed to be fair to everybody. If you you can be a lot more efficient if you didn't worry about being fair to people. Um, rather than get three low bids, just get a reasonable bid and go with it. Um, we try to be fair so everybody gets a fair shot. And when you do that, it's obviously not the most streamlined, reason, so we got to get a little balance. One of the things one of the problems with um, technology is when you submit a when you submit the bid, it's based on the technology you think is there now, and by the time the bids come in and you're ready to go, what you've designed into the project is obsolete. We need to figure out a way to uh, address this, and I don't know that uh, government has it right. If you can come up with recommendations, and NHTSA can be helpful in this, um, tell us how you can write the specifications so that they can incorporate the evolving technology. So by the time you're on the job and the technology has actually progressed, that you could substitute the technology or you can have it open so that as new technology comes in, it can be, um, it can be incorporated. Um, but I don't know that there's any, with the present system, 
trying to be fair to everybody, it's going to be hard to, uh, to do that without some specific recommendations from NHTSA and others. Yes, sir. Uh, somewhat related, but uh, a little different. Uh, one of the, I know one of the areas that we've been working on over the time of the caucus is try to get modeling and simulation uh, inculcated into uh, projects. Um, but what do you think, you know, often in the, the government side, even when we talk about soft uh, government owned and non proprietary solutions, uh, we have a problem with enforcement. Um, is there, what do you think about ways? Even when, if we were to get modeling simulation uh, pushed down into the system where we could enforce it? Well, I think one of the best things that's going to happen to modeling simulation would be Randy Forbes becoming Secretary of the Navy. Um, but uh, you mentioned non proprietary, and that's um, as people develop the software and get um, um, uh, copyrights and uh, intellectual property rights on that software, uh, we have. To, we have to encourage the government as they buy software to own the software. That way, uh, the next bid that goes out can build on the software. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, downloading all of, you know, up to that point is a lot uh, easier than trying to develop up to that point. And also, um, as you limit the number of platforms, the uh, competition will be on the application, not on reinventing the wheel to get up to get up to that same 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 point and so to the extent that we can uh, get the government owning the software and if you've uh, mapped out the interstate the next guy coming doesn't have to redo the interstate he can just start off with that and uh, and, and improve uh, so if we can have more non-proprietary software and the government buying the software and it becoming more open source I think um, uh, that would be, be helpful. We also need to do what we did in the transportation bill, remind people that modeling and simulation works not only in transportation, in the defense bill, in every other legislation that comes through, uh, to make sure that we're using modeling and simulation in all fields, medicine, health and human services. Um, I think um, uh, that would be helpful. Yes, sir. Here's a more free more free stuff question. Um, what can Congress do to uh, get a national high-speed internet free and open across the country, just like we did with GPS? <laughs> um, I, you know, I don't know that we've done that for GPS, um, um, but I think I'd like to have that answer come from the audience. Uh, to the extent that you can, and we can, fu we can fund it. There, there are um, challenges. Uh, some cities have um, just created a Wi-Fi throughout the city, much to the consternation of the people trying to sell it. And if you look at um, um, the cost of internet access in the United States, it, compared to access in foreign countries, people wonder, why in the world are you, they, they can't imagine paying that much for high-speed internet access. Um, uh, so I think um, uh, we, we have to deal with the competition factor. Um, that we're competing against people that are charging for it, and I, I think we just need to expand it. Sir. Sir, the, uh, an issue near and dear to the hearts here uh, for the special industry is this the process for the budget for this year. Do you see uh, we got a continuing resolution? Do you have any vision on how this all may turn out? Well, we, um, as I understand it, the plan is to have a short-term budget continuing resolution until the middle of next year. Um, the um, technical advantage of that means we get to do two budgets next year. There's a process called reconciliation where you can actually pass bills through the Senate without having to fool with the filibuster, which gives a, a huge bill the possibility of passing just on a straight majority. So if you have a majority of the House, majority of the Senate, just on party line votes, you can actually pass legislation through reconciliation. If you have two budgets, and you can only do one reconciliation per budget, 
Um, so the advantage in having two budgets next year is you can get two, rec two reconciliation bills. Um, that's, as I understand it, the plan, it's going to be a little dysfunctional having people in this audience trying to deal with a budget that only goes three or four or five months uh, and trying to plan on a budget, not knowing what the final numbers are going to be. Um, but I think that's uh, where we are. And one of the problems with changing parties um, in changing directions, you need, you may need that, um, they may, that two bites of the apple is a strong incentive. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, we have the world's largest gaming um, competition, serious game competition here at ITSIC, and uh, we believe strongly in the, the future for games in the education system. Do you have any thoughts about how we can promote that? Um, a lot of times it's, um, it does take some advanced um, cost up front, but it's, it's uh, the kids are all gaming, and if we can teach them while they're doing it, don't you think it would be a good idea? Yes, and um, you just wonder why we haven't moved forward in it. We, you know, the, the methodology for teaching now is a teacher, students, rows of seats, um, which is, ought to be by now a little obsolete. Everybody ought to be a little computer screen and the teacher kind of wander around as, as students are learning at their own pace and if there's one's having a problem, they can focus on it. Um, games would be extremely helpful in this. Um, there's not nearly enough research in which games actually move you forward in, in education. Um, and I just think that um, as we go forward in, 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 in education, this has got to play a much better, much um, bigger part of educating our next generation. We can't, I mean, a teacher wakes up after 30 year, thirty or 40 years of, uh, of sleep, comes into a classroom, and they're almost still qualified to teach. You go into a factory uh, 40 years later, it's not the same factory. There's no job 40 years later, uh, but teaching you have the uh, same situation. And, and I think we need to upgrade, and games can be a significant portion of this, where our young people are, um, are learning at a much faster pace than they're learning. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, the last question I'm going to ask you is uh, also near and dear to the heart of this, uh, especially the local group. Um, what do you what do you see in terms of the potential for a BRAC down the down the road? Um, hopefully, very little. As, as a, a representative of an area where um, Old Dominion University professors have estimated that 48% of the entire economy is dependent on the Department of Defense. I didn't say government spending, like Social Security and Medicaid and uh, NASA, you know, Department of Defense, mostly Department of the Navy. Uh, so when you start talking about closing military bases, um, you're, you're going to Midland. Um, I think we've gotten to the point now where the potential cost savings of another BRAC are so minuscule compared to the cost of actually closing the base that um, uh, inflicting the hardship on, on people. I think the last estimate, if you had another round of BRAC, you'd save about $10 billion, aggregate total present value, $10 billion. If you look at what localities and states will spend protecting themselves from the BRAC. I mean, you've wasted most of that. Uh, I remember when they, when they put Fort Lee on a, um, on a BRAC potential list, the lawyers told um, uh, Prince George uh, County that they had to delay their bond issue because if they didn't put the potential of a BRAC into their bond application, uh, they, it wouldn't be in good faith, and if they put it in there, the interest rate would go up. And so they, wait to, they had to wait to the end of the BRAC when they were not, they didn't think they were going to get close for Fort Lee, and they didn't, and then they can go forward. I mean, the, 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 when you inflict this kind of economic terror on, an, on, on a locality, um, uh, and, and you're scrambling around trying to protect yourself, you, you, states and localities will spend the better part of $10 billion protecting themselves, the amount of savings, and then you have to spend a lot of money in order to save the money. 
you know, to move people around. I know they closed Fort Monroe. Uh, and they had to spend a lot of money to move the people up to Fort Eustis, about 20 miles away. And by the time they did the housing and protected the uh, assets at Fort Monroe and did all the, what all the, what they had to do, I'm not sure they saved very much at all. Uh, they got environmental cleanup that did not have to be done if you maintain the military base. Um, and, and so I think we've gotten to the point where we've saved about as much as we uh, reasonably can with BRAC. And I think the um, um, uh, reaction in, in, in Congress, uh, when they have a no more BRAC amendments to defense bills, those things get um, uh, two thirds, you know, three fourths of the vote of members of Congress. Um, so I think the likelihood of another BRAC is, um, is small at this point. Right. So, sir, the uh, It's a Community is here and uh, appreciates you being here. What, what can we do to help you uh, on the Hill? Well, talk to your members of Congress to make sure they know the importance of uh, modeling and simulation, particularly how, how modeling and simulation can help uh, become more efficient and save money. And those are the kinds of things that uh, members of Congress would be looking for and that save money particularly because that would mean that we could spend money elsewhere. Um, uh, we've got budget problems and anytime we can get the job done cheaper is, uh, is good news to members of Congress. Uh, encourage them to join the Modeling and Simulation Caucus so that we can advance your cause in Congress. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Congressman Scott. You've been, like I said, he's been here every year. He's the last man standing, literally. Uh, well, thank you. Congressman Scott will be here for about 15 minutes uh, if you want to uh, cuddle up. Thank you very much.